Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our first concurrent session, Transplant Recipient Risk Scores and Risk Mitigation with COVID-19, to pause or not to pause, uh, program and lessons learned. So for this very timely concurrent session, our speaker today is Dr. Jack Gill. Dr. Gill is an Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology at the University of British Columbia. He is the Medical Director of the Kidney Transplant Program at St. Paul's Hospital in Vancouver. He also serves as Medical Director of Data and Quality for BC Transplant, President of the Canadian Organ Replacement Register Board of Directors, and as Treasurer for the Canadian Society of Transplantation. He is a research scientist at the Center for Health Evaluation and Outcome Sciences and recipient of a Canadian Society of Transplantation Research Excellence Award. Jack holds over 5 million in peer review funding as principal investigator and conducts epidemiology, health outcomes, and health policy research relating to living and disease kidney donation, cardiovascular disease in transplant uh, patients, and inequalities in donation and access to transplantation. So without further ado, please join me to welcome Dr. Jack Gill. Thanks very much um, for the opportunity to uh, present today. Um, I've been asked today to speak about um, our response to COVID-19 in the, in the kidney transplant side of things in the province. Um, the title of the talk is Risk Mitigation with COVID-19 and, and with an emphasis on kind of lessons learned and how we, how we went through this. So it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, and thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me to, to, to speak. So as we all know, we were hit um, quite significantly uh, and abruptly with, uh, with this pandemic. Um, and in March, in particular, is where we saw it in British Columbia and across Canada as, as a significant issue. Um, and all of us clearly were touched by this and impacted by this. Um, and in terms of where we've, we've kind of gone from this and, and how we've moved forward, um, really the first things that all of us were faced with is a lot of quick decisions that had to be made in terms of primary issue, which is, well, how do we safely deliver healthcare um, in this pandemic? Um, and how do we do what we need to do to take care of our patients? From the transplant perspective, a couple of the major issues were around, well, there's acute uh, and our chronic care that we need to provide to our prevalent transplant patients that are out there. And then there's also, for making sure we continue to provide access to both donation, living and deceased, as well as to kidney transplantation. So these were kind of the overriding priorities that, that we were considering. The challenge as all of us have faced during this, this time has been, there's lots of questions. And unfortunately, many of these are unanswered, if not all. Um, and so going back to March when this all began and, and us kind of looking at the step-by-step -step processes that we need to look at, there was a long list of questions. What's the risk of contracting COVID in transplant recipients? How do we quantify that? What's the risk of COVID related death in transplant recipients, even in the general population that hadn't really been clarified at that stage? What's the risk of contracting COVID in hospital when either recipients or donors come in for their procedures? What about the risk of transmission of COVID from deceased or living donors to recipients through the act of transplantation? What, uh, what are the statistics and what is the knowledge around that? And then on the conversely, what's the risk of delaying transplantation if we decide that we're actually going to not pursue transplantation while we're in the midst of the early phases of this pandemic? What are the downsides of that? And in understanding that, we need to know, well, what is the risk of COVID with a transplant versus somebody staying on dialysis for a longer period of time instead, even in terms of just catching COVID? And importantly, virtual care is something we're going to talk about, and that was the, the go-to kind of maneuver off the get-go, but what's the risk of not seeing our patients regularly in person in the same fashion that we do now, and, and what are the unintended consequences that we have to watch for? And lastly, and certainly not least, how do we actually treat and how do we detect and treat COVID in our patient population? What is the evidence around that? And so there was no shortage of questions, but unfortunately, as we all know, there weren't a lot of answers. Um, and so really we were put in a position where we need to create health policy in a bit of a void of evidence. Um, and, and this is not an unfamiliar territory for, for many of us, but still it's an uncomfortable place to be. And so in navigating this, there's some key principles really that, that we thought we needed to follow through. And, and so firstly, 
like everything we do, we need to put the patients at the center of it. So it has to be a patient centered approach to say, how are we going to move this forward and, and make sure that we can keep our patients as safe as possible. Secondly, when there's not evidence, you need consensus. So we need to work with our colleagues, both locally and nationally and internationally to learn from one another so that whatever decisions we're making, they can at least be anchored in some form of consensus so that we can move together. The next piece is transparency. Again, we're making decisions on the fly. We're making quick decisions. And it's really key that the, the, the relevant stakeholders are all engaged in that and that, they are, and that they understand what decisions are being made and that we are transparently describing them and articulating the rationale behind that so that we can always look back and understand why we did what we did. Um, also evaluating it is gonna be key. So we can't change a policy without having an evaluation piece. And so evaluating it real time so that we can iteratively you know, change as we need to, as we move this process along was another key piece. And lastly, as we've all learned, adapting has been absolutely essential to this. In the early phases, things were changing, not by the weeks, by the months, it was by the day and by the hour, we were getting new information and having to modify our protocols. And so adaptation is, is essential. So let's go through some of these. So what did we have to do from a patient-centric point of view? Well, the very first thing we had to do was say, well, let's identify which patients are at greatest risk of contracting COVID and developing complications. And that's both in our prevalent transplant population as well as those who are coming up to transplantation. And that'll help us decide what the best course of action is for that individual patient. The second piece was once we have done that, we need to now figure out policies that we can develop to minimize exposure of that risk, whether of contracting COVID, and then if people contract, what we can do to mitigate that risk from it becoming more severe. And in the midst of all that, the third key principle from a patient-centered approach is we have to maintain optimal care. So we need to make sure that the core business is what we do, ensuring safe transplantation, ensuring optimal outcomes post-transplant is part of this um, uh, whole process. So from a consensus perspective, well, we were fortunate that although we don't have a national transplant program like some countries do, we, we have over the last decade or so developed a fair bit of consensus on a number of issues in transplantation. And those bodies that have been involved came together very quickly to provide national consensus in the context of COVID. And so Canadian Blood Services, which, uh, which, reg which runs a lot of the registry-based work around uh, living um, kidney donations, such as kidney pair donation and that highly sensitized patient deceased donor registry. That was critical. Uh, they came together along with the Canadian Society of Transplantation, which is our professional organization, and Health Canada, which is obviously important from a government perspective. And we, we came together with representatives from across the country very quickly and had daily and then twice a week meetings around the following issues. So international information was being gathered. So people were talking to colleagues in other countries to understand what experiences they had in the transplantation realm and how we were gonna adapt that information. And also there was national consensus now on what we need to do in Canada with donation and transplantation practices during, during different phases of the pandemic. Provincially, we had uh, multi-organ donation and, and uh, transplant um, meetings uh, regularly every day and every week uh, are on, around how each of the organ groups are, are moving forward and sharing and, and keeping a dashboard of how we're doing that. We also had to engage on the transplant side with our, with our renal colleagues um, in terms of our referring practices as well as our regional nephrologists that are looking after patients provincially. And so we were engaged with the BC Regional Renal Program meeting so they knew what was at stake. And, and what was happening. And also with the renal health directors, there was a new daily meeting that was being done to, to keep everyone praised of the changes in the transplant programs. Now, nationally, the, the, the two big national programs that we, that we uh, use are the highly sensitized patient uh, registry program, as I say. So these are patients that are very difficult to transplant. They have CPRAs of 99, 100%. They're challenging patients to transplant. And when they get a transplant, it's kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity. And so the decision was made appropriately that despite the risks of COVID, we would not be passing on opportunities for these individuals and that we would have to figure out a way to transplant them. The other big national program where we share organs and ship organs is through kidney pair donation. And this is the kidney swap program. Uh, 
And the decision, the very difficult decision was made nationally by Canadian, by Canadian blood services to actually suspend the kidney pair donation chains as, uh, as of mid-March for a period of about six weeks while we wait and see what happens. And that situation was monitored daily to see how that unfolded. And so these national decisions got made very quickly uh, and kind of framed what we had to do. Other recommendations for individual programs that came out of this national consensus was around how we should handle our individual transplant programs across the country. And so recommendations were put forth to consider postponement of living donor kidney transplants for four to six weeks, given that these are technically elective surgeries that we could potentially safely postpone. Um, it was recommended that we suspend deceased donor transplants, except for the very highly sensitized patients, those that are 99% PRA or higher. And because obviously, as I articulated earlier, they, these people, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. There are some recommendations about therapeutics, about the use of drugs like thymoglobulin, which is a lymphocyte depleting agent. There was early suggestions that that may cause more harm in the context and increased risk in the context of COVID-19. And then on terms of the deceased donation side, there were some recommendations around how to go about doing organ recovery. So minimize travel for our, our organ retrieval teams. For deceased donation, there was lots of discussion around the country in terms of what the best uh, approach should be. And it was decided that organs should not be utilized if someone has active COVID-19. Uh, and if someone has had previously diagnosed COVID-19 that's resolved, they would need sufficient testing to confirm that they in fact are still negative. Obviously, people that were considered high risk were those that had been traveling, those had met symptoms based on a symptom screening tool, um, and then those potential deceased donors would, be, um, would undergo increased scrutiny. Ultimately, it was determined that every potential deceased donor in the country should be swabbed twice, irrespective of their pre-existing risk, um, one through nasopharyngeal, one through deep suction with an endotracheal swab to confirm uh, COVID-19 negative, COVID negativity to our best capabilities prior to proceeding with donation. What happened in British Columbia? So I'm just gonna go through the two time periods here. So I'll start from the early phase, from March to May. So as I said, the national programs for KPD were suspended uh, on March 15th. Living donor kidney transplantation in BC, we suspended on March 18th for a period of time. And deceased donor transplantation, we did not suspend. We continued, but on a case-by-case -case basis, we looked at this and we were very restrictive based on the risk-benefit ratio. In terms of our post-transplant care and our pre-transplant care models, we read to a very heavily virtual model. So over 90% of our patients and our ambulatory clinics were being done virtually. Um, that required us to really expand our post-transplant clinics so that we needed to see the same volume of patients but just spread out because we had to do this virtually. So it was important for us that we did not defer people's appointments indefinitely in the context of the pandemic. We needed to figure out a different way to assess them. We also did continued our pre-transplant, both donor and recipient assessments during this period of time. We did those virtually during this period as well. Um, it was clear early on that we needed to provide some directed care to patients who had symptoms that were suggestive of COVID-19. And this was a big deal because we needed to really understand how to best manage these patients. And there was not a lot of direction. And testing at that time, if you'll recall, was much more restrictive. And so we created these COVID clinics where we virtually assessed patients that presented with symptoms um, that were suggestive of COVID. And we would, through the transplant programs, follow up with these people on a regular basis. And so I held a clinic every day at 5 p.m. during this early period where I would call patients, we'd contact them, we guide them on their symptom management and when they should get tested and, and, and receive care. Virtual care, as I said, is, was, a, was a key component of this. This is just a snapshot of what people see on the current virtual health platform that we're using at St. Paul's. VGH has the same model. And so as you can see, people can see kind of what's happening in terms of they, they go into a virtual waiting room. We can provide information around COVID and, and links to relevant resources. Medication shipping is something that BC Transplant supported and paid for for patients so they wouldn't have to come and act uh, into a, into a high-risk setting to obtain their medications. Home blood pressure monitoring became very important and not everybody had blood pressure cuffs and so we helped people obtain those and in some cases sent them blood pressure cuffs so that they have access to that. And this resulted in a ton of enhanced communication with the transplant programs and patients. And so our nurses and our pharmacists have spent tireless hours calling people repeatedly to make sure that we were um, aware of, what they, of, of how, they're, how they were doing. 
Transparency, the way we addressed transparency, and this was through a number of ways so that everyone was aware of the different changes. So BC Transplant, as I said, had a dashboard so that all of the organ groups had their documents and policies were documented and, and, and recorded by BC Transplant. Public messaging was all consolidated through BCT. So this allowed us to not have a bunch, a bunch of different messages coming from different groups, but really we, de we developed the, 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 the communications and then they were um, presented by BC Transplant in a very consistent fashion. And as I said, we had weekly meetings with not just BCT, but we started to, as a transplant program, have weekly meetings with an, um, individuals from regional transplant programs so that we could talk about COVID and non-COVID related issues to just enhance that level of communication during this time. This is a snapshot of what's on the BC Transplant website. So as you can see, there's COVID-19 information. There's a series of questions on the right there looking at you know, frequently asked questions for patients in terms of their risks. Um, there's been a couple webinars now that have been completed and that are posted on BC Transplant's website um, that people can access afterwards to, to help educate patients and healthcare providers. Evaluation um, was key. We have to know how we're doing and we need to be able to pivot as needed to try to it, it maximize our, our, and optimize our outcomes. And so we've been tracking the, the suspected and proven cases of COVID uh, cases. Uh, and we just did that internally during the early phases. There was a survey that was conducted out of, out of Vancouver General uh, Hospital of patients that were undergoing virtual care. And uh, Cindy Lowe and Shauna Mann uh, there were, were leading that and, and looked at uh, getting patients' perspectives on how virtual care was going. And of course, we were tracking donation and transplant volumes through this entire time. So I'll give you some of that data now to just show you what, what some, some of the outcomes have been. And so the, the, looking at this period of time between March and May, there were 44 post-transplant patients at Vancouver Coastal and, and St. Paul's Hospital that had potential COVID symptoms that we assessed. 27 of those patients ultimately ended up getting tested for COVID. Four of them tested positive. Two of them um, unfortunately uh, passed away. Two patients were discharged. There was another presumptive case in hospital that we counted. Um, there were six COVID negative patients that were admitted to hospital with very suspicious symptoms. And there was one individual that had an unwitnessed death that ultimately was felt unrelated to COVID, although there was a suggestion of COVID symptoms. Um, and so that was the volume of cases there. Since then, there's been a dipping and now recently we're starting to see an emergence of more cases now with this second wave. This is looking at deceased donation activity in, in BC. And I've just kind of broken this up into the periods of uh, pre-pandemic and then in the, in the early phases of pandemic. And so just this only goes from January to April. So on the blue line on the top, you've got the number of referrals for deceased donors that BC Transplant received. And, and what you can see is that generally we were doing, they're getting somewhere between 40 to 50 uh, referrals per month. And that actually continued through March and April. The line in the green tells you how many organs were actually utilized. And so you can see that that number is very different. So donors that actually proceeded to donate numbers around 15, 10 to 16, pardon me, on a regular basis pre-pandemic. And that dropped quite precipitously to three in March and then started to pick up again a little bit in April. This is kidney transplant activity during the same period of time. And again, I've broken this up and, and into deceased and living. Um, and so in blue, you've got the deceased donor transplants. And this first number here is the monthly average of 2019. So on average, we do about 18 deceased donor kidney transplants per month in the province. Um, in January, we did a bit more than that. In February, we did a bit less than that, but it was averaging out. And then as the pandemic hit, those numbers really fell. So three deceased donor transplants in March, and then that picked up to six in April. And notably, some of these were import kidneys as well that we were getting from other places. If we look at living, donation, living donor transplantation, we've generally done about 10 living donor transplants per month in, in, in BC um, in 2019. And that, consists, that was persistent in the first few months of, of the year. And then as the pandemic hit, that number dropped as we, as we curtailed that activity in the tail end of March. And then as, as I said earlier, when it was suspended, there were no living donor transplants in the month of April. In terms of transplant clinic visits, now this is not just kidney, but it's predominantly the kidney transplant programs data. And this is looking at the total number of clinical visits. And as I said, we made an effort to make sure that we continued to see all the people that we needed to see throughout this through virtual clinics. And as you can see that actually stayed pretty consistent. There was a bit of a dip in the end of March as we were trying to 
sort out the virtual care platforms. And we did defer patients because it was unclear how safe it was for them to get blood work and things. But very quickly by April, we were up to the same volumes that we've always had in terms of, in terms of clinic volume. And so we continue to do that. Now, that was the early phase. That's how we kind of navigated that and, and, and moved through. So I talked about adaptation, and this was clearly the next phase as to how do we adapt. And so in April, it was becoming clear that British Columbia was taking a slightly different trajectory than other provinces in the country. And so we would likely be in a position to start to expand our transplantation services ahead of others. But again, collaboration was key here. And, and rather than do this in a silo, we took our recommendations, went back to the national group and then created a national working group. And, and we had a lot of you know, templates that we presented to that group so that we would get some consensus on those. But that allowed actually nationally to develop a series of guidelines on how we were gonna now reopen the transplant programs to closer to normal state. And so what came from that was a series of kind of guiding principles for how do we expand transplantation services again. And so these were important principles to put in writing and again speaks to the transparency of the process. So kidney transplantation, we have to remember, is not in most cases an urgent life-saving procedure. It's life prolonging. Therefore, we must spend the, uh, um, uh, balance the, the, the benefits of, the, of, the, of transplantation in the current state. And, in, and for every patient, it might not be clear cut that transplantation is the right choice right now. Also, the risks of benefits that need to be considered depending on the level of spread of, of COVID. And so we have to stage things based on what's happening in the community. We must ensure rapid availability of COVID-19 testing so that we can actually do the transplantation work in a safe manner. And of course, we have to acknowledge that in order to get through this period during the early phases of these transitions, we may need to deviate from our routine allocation policy, um, policies, and we need to be transparent about that. Um, we also need to make sure that from a clinical care perspective, we have COVID-19 free pathways in hospital and in out, inpatient and outpatient uh, platforms. And what I mean by COVID-19 free is that we put in all the protections we can to minimize the risk of COVID-19. And that's something we had to do. And that includes making sure we have the appropriate virtual care capacities in the early post-transplant period as well as late and that we've got the capacity in the hospital to, for beds, for PPE, for all the supports that we need. And then of course, from an evaluation perspective, it's key that we monitor what happens with this as we transition out so that we can learn from this experience and that we can also um, uh, modify our, our, our practice as we move through it. So these were the stages that we identified and, and that we've gone through. So there's four stages. The stage that I've described today is stage zero. That's where there was growing numbers of active cases and there was a significant community spread. And that's when we had suspension of, of living donor transplantation and selected deceased donor transplantation only. The other, from there, we proposed moving forward to different phases where you would actually get to a point where there's stable number of active cases. And that's what the, we, were, we were in the phase when we were developing these guidelines at this stage now in, in stage one. And then moved to stage two, which happened in the summer, where we had low number of active cases and low community spread, and then hopefully go to a point where someday we get to phase three, which is the virus is eradicated or there's effective treatments that allow us to resume practice back to normal. In terms of deceased organ donation, I touched on this earlier, but this was how we have approached this in the stage zero. So in, in, in the early phases where we were being very selective about who's transplanted, we were equally selective about the donors. And the goal here was to avoid donor-derived COVID and to also minimize exposure to patients to prolonged hospitalizations after transplantation and not require delayed graft function where they have to end up going to dialysis multiple times in an immunosuppressed state. And so for that reason, we, I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but largely we restricted this to um, neurologically uh, uh, determined donors, uh, determination of death donors, so that we would not, we would have a low risk of delayed graft function. And you know, we tried to um, uh, stick to that so that we have short hospitalizations during that early phase. During stage one, we also applied that algorithm. And as we went forward to stage two, we loosened that up to expand it to all deceased donors and a bit more um, to, to actually allow for increased access to transplantation during that period. On the recipient side, these are people on our wait list. We had to stratify them based on their risks. And it's the same principle here is we wanted to identify patients who are at higher risk 
of post-op complications and prolonged hospitalizations that would put them at increased risk of COVID-19 and, and associated risk. And so we broke people up into three groups here. Again, I won't go through this in detail, but basically we lumped people into low risk categories, intermediate risk categories, and high risk. And to give you an example, if someone had significant cardiovascular or respiratory disease, were extremely frail, had an, and very marginal candidates to begin with, those people were in the high risk group. And those individuals had to be really looked at carefully before we proceeded with transplantation during this transition. This is um, basically where we moved to. We took that and during each stage, in stage one, we, we started to start with our low risk transplant candidate population. And those are the individuals that were being routinely considered. Everyone else was still considered, but it was more on a case by case basis to ensure that we could weigh the risks and benefits. And then as we've moved through the other stages, that gave opportunities to now expand things out uh, to, to all transplant candidates. Now, in terms of our inpatient ambulatory processes, there's a number of things we had to put in place for, for living donor transplantation in particular. What we needed to do was um, have a mechanism of testing. And so, and this is continues now. So all scheduled living donor transplants, uh, uh, transplant donors and recipients, it, the process goes like this. 14 days prior to transplantation, a COVID negative swab is required. Then there's a 14 day isolation period for both the donor and the recipient, following which there's another COVID-19 swab. And then those individuals are, are, will undergo surgery and then the post-operative care will be as we've been routinely with virtual health and, and all the precautions in place. For deceased donor recipients, the protocols require a negative COVID-19 swab prior to surgery. And that's something we continue to do now. Post-operatively, we tried to reduce the frequency of in-person visits and developed a hybrid model with virtual care. And we've also had to increase communication with the regional nephrologists so that as we're transitioning people out, we can do this. For our, our pre-transplant assessments, we've now got a two-stage model where we're seeing all our donor assessments and our recipient assessments virtually first and then in person once they've gone through the first phase and we're consolidating their in-person assessments with all the testing they need to do so that we can minimize their exposure to healthcare settings. Now, where did we go? As I said, we were in May is when we transitioned to that stage one, out of that stage zero, really restrictive period to now doing selected living donor transplants and broadening out the deceased donor transplants. By June, we had very quickly moved to phase two, where we had now low, where, where there was a low number of active cases in the community, and we were able to now broaden out the types of people that we were transplanting in terms of living and deceased donor transplantation. And then actually, as we had, we got comfort with and, and safety data on how things were going, we very quickly actually progressed to phase three, which is kind of where we're sitting now, even though the virus isn't eradicated and, 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 and the vaccine isn't here yet. Um, the, our experience has showed us that we were able to actually expand our access to transplantation to all. So we're currently operating as per normal in terms of living in deceased donor transplantation from an access perspective. The policies and protocols remain. Um, the other important thing that's happened is kidney pair donation has resumed over the course of the summer, but predominantly using shipped kidneys. So Donors aren't having to travel to other provinces. Everything is done through shipping at this point in time. I just want to end by showing you where our data has gone so far now. So deceased donation now through August. As you can see, the deceased donor numbers, the referrals have actually picked up over the course of the summer, and the number of transplant of donors that are actually being actualized has increased back to where it normally was. If we look at what's happened in terms of transplant activity, as I showed you earlier, the, the blue line, deceased donors hit, deceased donor transplants hit a, a, a low point in March. And since then, there's been a steady rise and we have had a big increase in the number of deceased donor transplants. Living donor transplantation was suspended in April. And since then, there's been a resumption of that activity and we're doing that. However, those numbers haven't quite reached what they were before, partly because of the lag that's occurred in individuals that weren't getting their blood work done and getting evaluated during that early phase of the pandemic. And so that's something that's a priority that we need to continue to watch. Clinic volumes, as I showed you earlier, continue to remain the same. And that's persisted through now as we, as we continue through the, the subsequent phases of the pandemic. So what lessons have we learned? Well, I think national collaborations are something that's clearly needed and, and, and was very helpful in this. 
And that's something that can't be, be, uh, be understated. Um, virtual care has been a silver lining in this, in this pandemic. And I think we can all say that it's removed physical barriers or allowed us to expand our care to other regions and, uh, and provide more supports in those areas without having to create physical space. And that's been important. It's also validated our provincial model of how we provide care in this province and kidney care is provided provincially. And this is something that's been really critical that we've been able to do. Um, it's redefined multidisciplinary care. It's not just about the getting everybody together in a physical space. It's actually about working together on a continuum to make sure we do what's best for our patients. And it's most importantly to me anyways, highlighted the dedication that exists in our field and in our teams to patient care. The number of hours and that people have worked and how tirelessly people have worked to put this at the forefront and make sure that our patients are getting the best care has been really touching and impressive to me because it really does speak to the, the renal community and how we, how we work in this field. Some important limitations that have come up is virtual care is not perfect and we need to understand how that works better. We need to make sure that we continue to, to address those limitations. The living donation legs I showed you earlier is a concern that we need to try to rectify. Shipping kidneys through across the country for, for living donors is something that's actually a great thing that we're now doing, but there have been some challenges in terms of Air Canada and those kinds of issues that we need to work through. Hospital capacity is something that remains an issue. Out of town patients are still having a challenge because they have to come and stay in hotels and there's been outbreaks in hotels and those challenges that we need to continue to address. And vulnerable populations is still a concern um, that we're not, they're not being unfairly disadvantaged through this process. I'll quickly just sum up here. Obviously we know we're now in, a, in the midst of a second wave and, and there will be additional challenges ahead, but I think we're in a better position because we have more information. So we understand now what the data looks like. So we can tell our patients, there's about a 50% higher incidence of COVID-19 among transplant recipients compared to the general population. We know there's a higher mortality. It's in the odds of 20 to 30% compared to the general population, which is lower than that. But we also have increased testing capacity and we've got safety protocols in our healthcare system now that are a bit more entrenched and hopefully will allow us to navigate the system better. And importantly, the data is still coming. It's still preliminary data. We still need to continue to move through this, but hopefully our improved understanding and the protocols we've put in place will help us navigate this second wave. I'd just like to end with this quote uh, from Albert Einstein. And, um, you can read it in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. Um, this is the way we've tried to look at this. And I think as a community, renal community, this is how my sense is everyone's tried to look at this. And I hope that as we continue to navigate these, these, these difficult waters, that, um, that this will be the attitude and hopefully we'll end up on the other side of this pandemic with better patient care and a better perspective on, on what we do. So I'll end there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jag. Um, as always, a very exciting and insightful presentation and a timely presentation as well. Um, I just want to remind the audience um, that if you go through to your um, event app, you can enter questions, which we will take uh, during the Q&A sessions. We have 10 minutes. And maybe I'll ask the first one here. Um, so Jag, we've seen the transplant activity wax and wane during this time. And as you said, we're in the midst of a second wave at the moment, probably might get worse as we go into the winter. We're better equipped. We know a few more things. Do you foresee the living donor transplant program being um, uh, on hold again um, as the numbers get worse in, in the country? Or do you foresee that we have more um, knowledge and maybe some tools that can help us continue that, to, 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 um, uh, that, that service to in, into the winter? Well, thanks, James. Uh, I think um, the intent is that we would avoid any sort of a shutdown, I think. Uh, now, there's some things out of our control, obviously, um, in terms of hospital ca capacity or those kinds of issues that we may not be able to control fully. But I think the idea that um, from a safety perspective, um, we will have to continue and potentially continue to modify our existing protocols to, to reduce the, the risk. One of the things that, you know, did happen with when, when things were held up um, in, in April, when, we're, when there were any living donor transplants, is a lot of patients, I think, were uh, delayed, but at the same time, 
there was a challenge that they faced with that, right? There are some people who are preemptive transplant candidates who would transition to dialysis. And I'm not sure that uh, transplantation uh, in a hospital setting is necessarily going to substantially increase their risk versus someone who's going to be in the community and be going to dialysis and those kinds of issues. So um, I think the intent would be, James, that we would continue with with transplantation services um, as fully as we possibly can. And I do think we have the tools hopefully to, to do that. Excellent. And I, I agree with you. I think in the beginning, our community took a very cautious approach, um, but I think there's more data now basically saying that patients on dialysis, their risk uh, when they contract COVID and uh, their outcomes are likely worse than patients who uh, despite being on immunosuppression, have a functioning L graft. Um, that brings me to the next question as well. We have a number of patient partners um, listening in. Um, on the national calls, are there um, ways for the patient's voice to be um, to be heard and to be considered as um, you know uh, the policies are being made as well? Um, obviously, from the uh, medical per perspective, we want safety for all the patients, but you know, do they have a say? Um, is there a way to integrate their, their voice as well? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's, a, that's an excellent point. And I think um, that is, um, I believe there is patient representation uh, embedded in those national uh, uh, meetings. Um, but I think that's a key point, right? I think, you know, it, it, as we're developing any sort of health policy or any sort of, you know, clinical care pathway, um, it's critical that we include the patient voice in that. So those opportunities certainly do exist. That's excellent. Um, you have said uh, we have had to reimagine the post-transplant care um, during this time. And what do you find is the biggest challenge um, in, in this virtual model uh, for, for the post-transplant patients? Well, I, I think the most acutely the challenge has been workload, I think, for, for many of the team members, right? So. Um, when we're not when we're not consolidating our our post transplant care in a, a fixed number of clinics where we can get multidisciplinary care and everyone sees everybody at the same time, it's now spread out a little bit. And so what ends up happening is is that you have multiple telephone calls, multiple points of connection with different team members. So I, I know for a fact that our nursing teams um, and our pharmacy staff has been worked very, very hard, right, to, to kind of sustain the level of care that we provide. And, and you know, truthfully, uh, I don't, you know, without those individuals, there's no way this is sustainable. It just wouldn't have happened. Uh, and, and so I think making sure that, that people are able to sustain that and they have the sufficient supports to continue to do that and not burn out is going to be a, a real danger and something that I think we need to really prioritize. Um, and then there's the logistics of not everybody from a patient perspective is able to actually interact in, in, in the right manner uh, virtually. And so, you know, I mentioned we have a hybrid model, as you know, right, and at both sites. And so it really is kind of a triage system that if we can't get a proper assessment done virtually, if a patient is not, um, is having more difficulty with connectivity or difficulty with being able to get their vitals checked, well, then we have to see them in person and that capacity has to exist. And so that's what we're doing. Um, and so as we move forward, I think it's, Virtual care is fantastic, um, but we need to, again, like everything else, stratify which scenarios and which patients it's ideal for and which cases it's suboptimal for so that we can, we can optimize that care best. Yes, for sure. Um, you mentioned uh, Cindy Lu and Shana Mann's research looking at patient satisfaction with the virtual care. I can certainly say at VGH, the overwhelming response has been that it's been very positive. And in fact, many patients, even when the pandemic ends, were likely say that they prefer the, uh, the virtual care and certainly we all find a path for that. Do you have similar uh, experience or, or um, outcomes over us and Paul's? Yeah, I think for the most part, um, you know, it, it's been quite positive. I think for, it's not easy for patients to come to our sites and, uh, and go through all the rigors and then waiting to be seen. And so certainly being able to do that for at least a portion of their visits from the comfort of their home helps. Um, now, that's particularly relevant for people who aren't in the lower mainland or people who live, you know, uh, further away. And so giving them increased access has been a very good thing. Um, there are challenges in terms of, I think, um, socioeconomic status and connectivity ability and those kinds of things. Not everybody has um, an electronic device that allows them to easily connect virtually. 
And those are some of the things I think we need to be creative about as a community to say, how do we bring everybody up to that level so that if there's communities where there that is lacking, that I, I'm an advocate for, we should be providing that or, or partnering with communities to actually enhance their ability to do that. Absolutely. So um, I think our time is up. Thank you very much again for an exciting session and for your insights. Um, lunch is up next. The cooking demo is going to begin at 1135 through the live webcast at the top of the schedule. We'll see you very soon afterwards. Thank you again, Jay. Thank you.